Let's go ahead and pray together, okay? Father, thank you so much for the amazing words in the Gospel of John that to any individual who receives your Son, that we will become children of God. And Lord, we thank you for the way that even though we were your enemies and estranged and distant and removed and really honestly not really caring a lick about holiness or obedience, that you've demonstrated your love for us even in the midst of our sin so that we could be brought back to you to be restored into a right relationship with our creator. And Father, we thank you that you have adopted us as your children, to be sons and daughters, to live life as we have worshiped this morning, life that is free, that is full, that is expressive of the power of the risen Savior. And Father, it's because of Jesus, our crucified risen, exalted Lord, that we worship you this morning. And so we pray that as we have blessed you with our praise, that you would bless us with a greater commitment to holiness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are so excited. We are thrilled for our graduating high school seniors. And I'm looking at some of you. And I know that God has prepared for you a future that is designed to bring you into a deeper and a closer relationship with his one and only son. And we are praying for you because we know that even as you stand at the brink of making one of the most significant decisions of your life, maybe even at this point, the most significant decision of your life that would affect your future, at least your immediate future, We want you to know that our hearts are with you, that we're praying with you, that we're encouraging you, that we're with your moms and your dads, and we are hopefully not hovering over you or pressuring you, but supporting you and encouraging you to really seek God's direction in your life. I know that for your moms and dads and for Will and for all of your counselors, we really desire the very best in your life that your college years would not only be a place where you discover what you want to study and maybe even fine-tune how God has wired you, but that you're going to experience some of the most spiritually formative, even transformative experiences that will be with you for the rest of your life, maybe even for all eternity. And we're especially grateful to God for the way that he sustained you on every single level, especially in the last two years, through the pandemic. And we know that it's been a a stretching and a challenging and sometimes a draining and a disappointing time. But it's also been a time when you've gone deeper and you've grown stronger in your faith and that you've become more resilient and more confident in God's purpose and direction for your life. And for some of you, your decision, which many of you are still contemplating, making this week about your future. For some of you, the decision is clear as day. It's an easy decision. It's obvious where God wants you to go, the field that you want to study. But for others, you're torn and and you're agonizing, and it's not an easy decision and one day you'll feel this way, and another day you'll feel that way. And, and, and it's, I mean, if you were like one of our kids, and I won't mention his name, but it's our younger son. He made his decision on April 30th. And we were afraid that the servers were going to crash right at April 30th. We thought, John, just get it in, you know, just make that decision. And so as a mom and dad, we understand the struggle that our students have as they make such a a weighty decision in such an early stage of their young adulthood years. And there's this wide range of emotions that's felt by both our graduating seniors, the class of 2022, and the incoming class of college students, class of 2026. And there's emotions that 
the moms and dads feel as well. Because this transition marks a major step toward increased freedom. And for Helen and me, for our kids, when our nest became emptied, it truly became emptied. Because we realized that as they went off to college, that they would never return to our home to live full time as they were growing up as children. And so we recognize the weightiness and the gravity and, and the, the significance of this juncture. That freedom relates to how our students are going to wake up for class, how they get their work done, the extracurricular activities that they choose, the balance in their life between their studies and their social life and their other outside interests. And if you talk to any college students, it's absolutely mind-boggling the number of things that they have on their plates. If we think our high school students are full of so many good things, our college students have even more good things on their plates that are filling their lives, that are stretching their time, that are even testing them. There's an increased measure of freedom about the friends that they develop, even the people that they decide to date. And for our family, our students, our children, their college sweethearts became their lifelong partners. And so we understand that in college, it may not just be a date, but it could actually be a lifelong partner. We understand that in college, that our students make their decisions about whether or not they're going to be a part of a local ministry on campus, whether they take the initiative to find a local church, whether they take their faith seriously enough to not only re-examine and, and think through what they've grown up with, but whether they actually grow stronger and deeper in their love for Christ and in their knowledge of the gospel. For our graduating seniors, the next four years is going to be a time of both freedom and responsibility. Freedom to make their choices, to use their time to explore the world around them, but also responsibility to know who they are in Christ, to understand that their primary responsibility is to be faithful to God with the responsibilities that God has given to them. The primary responsibility of being a student on that campus. Those two qualities, freedom and responsibility, are always paired together. Because true freedom bears personal responsibility. And that relates to how you and I relate to our Father in heaven. The freedom that God graciously grants to us through his one and only Son carries the responsibility and the expectation that we would consistently honor God with our life. Because God powerfully frees us from sin to gratefully serve him with righteousness. And that's a message that Paul is going to deliver not only to the church at Rome, his original audience, for this letter that develops not only what it means to believe in the gospel, but what it means to act out the gospel in our lives. Because we never move on from the gospel, but we move on in the gospel. And so we see that God powerfully frees us from sin so that we could gratefully, humbly, consistently serve him with righteousness. In other words, God liberates us from spiritual bondage so that we might love him with heartfelt obedience. And last week as we celebrated Jesus' triumph over death, defeating sin for us through his death and resurrection, today is really the follow-up to that message. And it's amazing. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, next to the miracle of the resurrected Savior is the miracle of everyone coming to church on Easter Sunday. It's an amazing thing that, that for whatever reason, people get religious on Easter Sunday and they show up. 
And they, they give lip service to the resurrection and the triumph of Jesus over death and over sin. But then the week after Easter, life resumes as normal. And so we're back to our kind of our, our regular population. And I know churches around the world will have a record spike and then a normal resumption of everyday attendance in gatherings like ours. But it's not a letdown. Because Paul develops this concept that in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we experience a freedom that not only empowers us to know that we are dead to sin, but that we are also alive to God. God liberates us from spiritual bondage so that we might love him with heartfelt obedience. And Paul is going to say we were once slaves to sin. We were once in bondage to wickedness. But now we are slaves to holiness. And if we think back to Romans chapter 1, the very first phrase that Paul uses to introduce himself, he said, I'm a doulos of Christu Yesu. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm a bondservant of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's no surprise that Paul is consistent in the language that he's going to see not only is he a slave of Christ, but to be a slave of Jesus is to be a slave of God's righteousness. And it's not a drudgery, it's not a burden, but we have been set free from bondage so that we could love God with heartfelt obedience. When we talk about freedom, we typically think of it as anything goes. If you think about what it means to be free, we think about our, our liberties as Americans and the independence that we cherish. We want to assert our rights. We recoil at the sense of restrictions or mandates that seem to impinge upon our freedom or take away our liberties. And so it's not surprising that this notion of freedom, doing whatever we want, that it guides our everyday choices. It also shapes our moral framework and even impacts our personal relationships. But it could also enter into our local faith communities where we think that to be free in Christ is to be able to call the shots, to be able to do as we please, to follow our wants and our desires, and that we become more American in our theology than we are biblical. We begin thinking about what is it that is in it for me and my rights and my freedom as opposed to what it means to really live according to the responsibilities and the calling that God has given to us. Real freedom, biblically speaking, is less about doing whatever I want and it's more about doing what God desires. It's less about thinking about what's your dream and what's your wish and what's your passion. And it's more about us asking God, what is your priority? What is your purpose? What is the focus of your kingdom? And so the title for today's message is Free to Serve. Because God frees us to serve him. Fulfilling his grand purpose and design for us. And freedom, biblically speaking, from the perspective of the Apostle Paul, boils down to doing the will of God and not our own. It's where freedom prompts us to seek and to serve God according to his desires and to gladly and joyfully and wholeheartedly pursue his purpose for ourselves. And so a question that I'd like us to consider today in light of today's passage in Romans chapter 6 is this question. Is there a part of our life that we can more fully surrender to God? And that's what Alex and our worship team led us in at the very top of our service. To think about how we can surrender all to God and how all that we give to Him is exactly what He deserves. And as we think about the freedom that we enjoy as followers of Christ, I want us to think concretely and even specifically about is there a part of my life, maybe 
a part of my life that I've kept in the corner, that I've maybe even kept under lock and key, where I've said, God, I'll give you any part of my life but this part. Because, God, if I give you that part of my life, then I feel like I give you my very identity. Is there a part of our life that we could more fully surrender to the authority and the leadership of Christ? In other words, is there a particular habit or maybe a personal struggle, an ongoing battle where I desperately need God's power for a breakthrough? And I want to thank Auntie Faith and for all of those that are teaching with her to help our youngest students to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ not only gives them victory over death, but it empowers them to have victory over sin, even in their life. Whatever battles they might face on their campus or even in their community, even with their family, that God desires to give them the power of the resurrection to live in obedience to him. And it's an obedience that is wholehearted and that is joy-filled. So I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And we're going to look at the last part of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. And in verses 15 to 19, Paul is going to say there's just two options. We are slaves of sin, or we are slaves of righteousness. And there's no third option where we can say, well, you know, I'm not really all bad, and I'm not all good, but I'm kind of like in the middle, mediocrity, lukewarm, you know, a little bit, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, sin and righteousness, combo meal type, you know, character. And Paul says, no, either we are serving sin because our decisions affect our destiny, or we are slaves of righteousness. And in the same way that there are only two options, there are only two destinies because what we choose will lead to either death or to eternal life. It'll either lead to further separation from God or it will lead to sanctification and holiness and life with God. And so since all of us are either in Adam as fallen humans or in Christ as God's new creation, Paul says we just have two options. We're slaves of sin or slaves of righteousness. Take a look at verse 15. Paul starts with a couple questions just as he did the top of the chapter. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. There's just two options. We're either slaves to sin or slaves of righteousness. And similar to how we started this chapter, Paul entertains the question of whether God's abounding and abundant grace becomes an excuse for sin. He wondered in the beginning of the chapter whether the fact that God's grace superabounds to us, even in the midst of our abounding moral depravity, the, in the midst of our rebellion, God says, man, you could never out-rebel me or out sin me where the grace of God is not beyond your reach. And Paul knows where my twisted mind can go. He knows where we could look for a loop to, to kind of exploit for, for our own gain. And he says if we recognize that we have died to sin and we're alive to God, then we would never want to sin because we're done with that. And how can we who have died to sin live in it any longer? And at the end of the first part of chapter 6, verse 14, he says, the whole thing is we're under grace, no, no longer under law. That is, we're no longer under that period that started with Mosaic, the Mosaic Law and Exodus and Leviticus and that led us all the way up to the time of Christ. But now we're under a period of grace where through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law for us. 
and that we're no longer obligated to the law, that doesn't become a license for lawlessness, but that God in his perfect fulfillment of the law through his one and only son, we can live under grace. A period in which we are a new creation, where the old is gone and the new has come. And Paul says, having inaugurated the new period of grace through the perfect obedience and sacrifice of Jesus, does that mean that I am free? That you are loose to do whatever you want? And Paul says, man, not on your life. He says, God forbid. Older translations say things like, may it never be. Perish the thought. I mean, if the thought comes up, poo, extinguish that idea. Don't even let that wild consideration enter into your thought and your heart in your relationship to God. Because if we properly understand the grace of God and the mercy of God that we have received, that even though we were enemies of God, God set it up where we could be restored into a right relationship with him. That we would never want to go back into the old life. We would forever want to cut ties with the sin that so messed with us. And Paul says, may it never be. He says, let me defend my argument. He raises another question. He says, don't you know that if we present ourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, we become slaves of the one whom we obey, either sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness? We may not always recognize it, but whether we recognize it or not, we are servants. We become subject to, we place ourselves under the decision that we make. And so sometimes in the smallness of my own heart, I could rationalize my disobedience and say, well, that's just a small thing. Or it's kind of a harmless sin. Or, you know, it's not a biggie. I mean, I'm not, it's not like I'm really breaking one of the huge Ten Commandments. It's just like a you know, minor infraction of God's law. And Paul says, man, if I ever think that way, Dan, don't I realize that I become a slave of the one I choose to obey? I become a servant to whatever desire becomes my master. So I can never say, well, it's just a small thing or a little thing or a minor thing. Because once we rebel against God in a small way, then it cracks open the door to rebel against God in a not-so-small way. And before you know it, the thing that I thought I had control over begins to have control over me. And it has mastery. And, and that's why it's crazy, but those who, who go to 12-step programs or those who have issues with addictions, the first thing that comes to their mind is they say, I'm not addicted. I'm not in bondage. And there's a real sense of denial and a rejection of the idea that they become a slave to the thing that they obey. And so Paul gives us a reality check, and he says, whether it's sin or obedience, whether it's what Adam did in flaunting God's authority or whether it's what Jesus did, tempted even as we were, and yet not sinning. That whatever choice that you make, you become a servant of. And the choice that you make will lead either to death or it will lead to righteousness. We prioritize whatever we prize. We choose whatever we cherish, and whatever we decide becomes our destiny. Envisioning the ultimate end, 
ought to inform our immediate decision. And so that's what Paul is thinking. He doesn't say, you know, live in the moment, decide in the moment. He says, think long term. Think destiny. Think direction. Am I looking at death or am I looking at righteousness? Am I looking at separation or am I looking at intimacy with God? And the reality check that he gives to me and that he gives to you is simply who is our master? Who is the one that we are serving? Are we choosing to obey sin or are we choosing to obey righteousness? And Paul simply admits that we're all living a life of obedience, but it's a matter of the master whom we are serving. Take a look at verse 17. He goes from this reality check that we're either a servant of sin or of righteousness to making the right choice. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. And it's that first phrase in verse 17 that you just want to linger. It's as if you want to mentally underscore that idea. Because Paul says, well, we were either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. We were either destined for death or destined for life. But then he says, but thanks be to God. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a reality that he paints for us, that he leads us to the way of righteousness. And he says, once slaves of sin, spiritual bondage in its grip, under its authority, God liberates us to become slaves of righteousness through Jesus. And what that means is we now freely, gladly, joyfully, wholeheartedly can surrender our hearts to God in obedience. That is, we eagerly obey God because we sincerely love him. And that's the victory that he gives to us through his one and only son. We yield ourselves to God the God whom we deeply love and totally trust. Douglas Moo talks about the nature of our freedom in Christ. And he says, in a world in which freedom has taken on all kinds of historical and social baggage, we must remember that Paul's concept of freedom is not that of autonomous self-direction. Nilly, willy, do whatever you want. Chart your own course but of deliverance from those enslaving powers that would prevent the human being from becoming what God intended. The essence of real freedom is being released from the bondage that we inherit in Adam. And it's being redeemed with the blessings that we receive in Christ. We are free from sin to serve with righteousness. And so rather than simply satisfying our own desires, rather than thinking about what is it, what is it that, that will fulfill and will satisfy and energize me, it's thinking in terms of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, that we are God's workmanship that we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so genuine freedom, biblical freedom in Christ, is a matter of thinking about the good works that God wants to align our lives to, the, the godly character that he wants to reproduce within our lives. Take a look at verse 19. Paul says, I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. It is because of our fallen and fragile human nature, prone to sin and to collapse under temptation. He says, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness 
leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. The New City Catechism, question 32, actually raises a question that comes right out of Romans. What do justification and sanctification mean? Exactly what Paul is talking about in chapters 4, 5, and 6. This is how they answer the question. Justification means our declared righteousness before God, made possible by the death of Christ and his resurrection for us. Sanctification means our gradual growing righteousness made possible by the Spirit's work within us. And so justification is the fact that God has declared us innocent or right before him on the basis of our faith. Sanctification is that process, that ongoing development of righteousness within us that is becoming who we are in Christ. And one of the features of the New City Catechism is they also provide a suggested prayer in light of that question. And this is what the prayer is. Our Savior and Lord, you have completed the work of our justification. We have, you have begun the work of our sanctification, and we trust that you will carry us through to its completion, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And so the prayer is that you would transform us day by day into your likeness, conforming us to your ways. Amen. And so in bondage to sin under Adam, we once essentially didn't have a choice. We were under the authority of sin. We were in its grip. But now we have become slaves of righteousness. And so the fact that we have been set free, it's not to do whatever, but it's to do exactly what God has designed us to be and to become to fulfill his purpose, and to reveal his righteousness. And so now that we have been set free by God and Jesus, we must now present ourselves as slaves to righteousness. If you're part of the Bible reading program, the Robert Murray McShane program that's taking us through four passages of Scripture every day, we just finished going through the book of Leviticus. And I've got to be totally honest with you. As I've been listening to Leviticus, I'm not always in tune with what's being said. It's easy to lose sight and lose track of all of the laws and the regulations. And my hats are off to my friend who is preaching in West L.A. through the entire book of Leviticus. Could you imagine that? I mean, Leviticus chapters 1, 2, 3, all the way to 27, and he thanks God that he still has a position at the church. It's unbelievable. But it's a tough read. And if you've been reading and listening to it with us, I mean, we understand how it's really easy to kind of, you know, increase the speed or to swipe through the pages because it's so easy to just get lost in the laws. But then as I was coming to the end of the book, I remembered, man, this is a book that the people of God living under the law that they could not be fast and loose with. Because if they didn't do things just as God prescribed, just as Moses recorded, that could be their last act of worship. Their choices had huge consequences. And we think, man, I'm no longer under the law, no longer have to bring the sacrifices, no longer have to present myself to the priest and to have offerings lifted up, you know, to, to, to confirm purification or a miracle or anything like that. And we think, man, that is so good. And sometimes in our freedom, Forget that our decisions today are just as important as they were back then. 
that they're consequential, that they're weighty, that they're significant. And I might look at something as a small thing and maybe dismiss it as, as really being important before God. But just as there are only two options, that we're a sin of righteousness or a sin of, a servant of sin or a servant of righteousness, there are really only two destinies. What we choose will either lead to death or eternal life. Henry Blamiers was a student of C.S. Lewis. And back in 1963, he talked about the necessity of the Christian mind. And one of the things that he said about the Christian mind is it's, he talked about its supernatural orientation. And this is what he writes. Supernatural orientation means that the Christian cultivates the eternal perspective and that Christian cultivates, that it bears, brings to bear upon earthly considerations the fact of heaven and the fact of hell. That is, the supernatural orientation considers the reality of our eternal destiny, whether we are bound for heaven because of our relationship with God through Jesus or whether we are bound for hell because we are undecided about the person of Christ. And so he says, our orientation of a supernatural God ought to have a daily impact on our decisions. And that's exactly what Paul says here, that what we decide about Jesus in our lifetime really determines where we will stand with God for all eternity. We must always couple our today with our forever. Take a look at, first of all, the destiny of shame and of death, starting at verse 20. For when you were slaves, looking back, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You, that, you did, that was not your burden. That was not your interest. In fact, that was not even your capacity to do what was pleasing before God. But verse 21, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And we normally don't think of ourselves as sinners by nature or by practice. We generally view ourselves as good people, as decent people who occasionally blow it and maybe mess up occasionally from time to time. But John Piper identifies the core issue of sin. He says sin is that power, that authority within us, that decision that looks at the glory of the immortal God and says, well... I prefer man. I prefer money. I prefer power. I prefer fame. And as the apostle informs us early in this letter, we sin whenever we exchange the truth of God for a lie. When we take the glory of the immortal creator and say, God, forget your glory, and we exchange it for the glory of the creature. Whenever we make less of God and more of something or someone else, we engage in sin. And being enslaved to sin, Paul simply says, means that we were free from righteousness. That is, we didn't have the desire, but we also didn't have the capacity or the ability. And the end result of our slavery to sin is death. Spiritual death, physical death, eternal death. Separation from God for all eternity. And separating ourselves from God in this life means that God will separate himself from us in the life to come. Take a listen to the destiny of sanctification and eternal life. Verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin, you were once slaves of sin and destined for death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification, this growth and holiness, this 
becoming more and more like our Savior, and its end, eternal life. And then verse 23 is as concise a presentation of the gospel, just like John 3.16. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our original destiny of shame and death, Paul says, it's gone. It's no more. But God graciously releases us from our sin so that we might gladly, wholeheartedly serve him with our righteousness. And so the wage, the just reward, the fair compensation, Paul says, of our sin is separation from God, both spiritually, physically, and eternally. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And our study through Romans has given us ample opportunities to think about where we stand before God and whether we have been set free and whether we have been liberated from bondage and whether we are no longer objects of his wrath deserving the payment and the penalty of our sin, which is death, and whether we have trusted in Jesus as our personal Savior, believing that he died on the cross for us and that he rose in the tomb so that we could be set free from sin to serve him with his righteousness. That gift of eternal life is something we can enjoy today with joy and with peace and with hope. But then it's a gift that we will fully experience and God will fully express toward us when we experience glory in the life to come. During the first year of college, even the first quarter, maybe the first semester, our students are immersed in life like they have never known it. The freedoms that they enjoy and the choices and the opportunities. Their studies and the extracurricular activities and the activities and just hanging out with friends and making new friendships that will last a lifetime. And moms and dads may just wonder, hey, <laughs> How, how's it going? What are you up to? And they might just say, you know, just send us a text occasionally. Just three letters, P-O-L. You know, just let us know. Just send us a simple text to mom and dad, P-O-L. Proof of life. Not just when you need money. Not just when you need your laundry done. But just let us know that you're alive, that you're okay. And I think of Romans chapter 6, and I think Paul is using those three same letters. He's giving us P-O-L, proof of life, of what it means to be a slave of sin, in bondage to death, not having even the capacity to do what is pleasing before a holy God, but then being united with Jesus in his death and his resurrection and even his exaltation and how being united with our risen and exalted Savior that not only sets us free from death and from sin, but it liberates us for righteousness and for life. And we mentioned this last week, but you and I, we become part of the argument for the defense of the resurrection. Because when people get to know you, and when they scratch a little deeper, and when they see how you handle life, especially in the dips, and in the valleys, and in the struggles, then they will see, wow, there's, there's a power, there's of victory. There's an authority. And they may not use those words because those are biblical words. 
But they're going to say there's something about your life that provides proof for something that, that I am on the brink of believing. What is it all about? And that opens the door for you and me to talk about the power that God gives to us through his one and only son that we experience by his spirit so that they could look at you and they could look at Bread of Life Church and they say, man, you are a part of that community. And they don't use the vocabulary, but they say, man, there, there is a rightness and there is a goodness and there is a quality of your life that shows how your decisions today are coupled with forever. And sin, it's a battle, but that battle belongs to God. And we are strong in him, and we are full of his spirit, and we trust in his word, because we believe that God speaks truth to us, and our God is good, and we could freely obey him with our whole heart. God powerfully frees us, powerfully liberates you from sin so that we could gladly and gratefully serve him with righteousness. Let's pray together. God says, to you and me. There's just two choices. It's sin or it's righteousness. Only two destinies. Death, separation, or life. freedom. Where are you today? Maybe you've been still on the fence. Maybe a little bit of feeling a little spiritual, but haven't come specifically to terms to believe in Jesus as your personal Savior. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Believe in Jesus as the one who died for you and who lives again so that you could live with his resurrection power. And you could believe right now How about the rest of us? Paul simply says, own up to our sin and offer up to God's righteousness. Come clean with the wickedness and invite the Spirit of God to fill us with his holiness. Father, you know the battles. You know the struggles. You know the temptations that have been weighing heavily upon us. And I pray that you would help us as your people to be able to say, God, we present the members of our body to you as slaves, as servants of righteousness. And we know that it's a daily thing. And as we do, then we could speak with authority and with conviction about the life that is ours in Christ. And so we pray that you would 
give us that that honesty that leads to your holiness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.